I am, of course, particularly uh, happy to uh, to be among this uh, this list of, of best papers uh, here, being at least a representative uh, author on, on, on our paper. Um, and this is, uh, um, um, well, a kind of, uh, I'm, I'm humbled because there are so many great papers at development, and I'm sure we are just uh, one of, of many. So I guess it was a very hard um, a choice to make. And I'm particularly happy also because our submission was actually a, a review comment submission. And I'm grateful for the development editors um, that they actually support this initiative. And here I'm also grateful to Ike Lariuta that uh, he, he actually handled our, our manuscript. So thanks a lot for this. And we, we heard already quite a bit about um, uh, evolution before in, in this talk. And uh, I think then it's, it kind of makes sense to, to get back to the godfather of evolution, uh, to, to Darwin. Um, but what is maybe less known is that the Darwin was not only looking um, at animals, but he also liked to uh, work on, on plants and uh, look at their adaptation. Um, and he had some contributions to uh, a little molecule that is indole 3 acetic acid, um, because he envisioned that there is actually a, a mobile growth a regulator in plants. And, um, and and this mobile growth regulator was later on termed auxin from the term uh, Greek term for auxin, which means to grow. Um, and Darwin figured that there's a directional growth reaction towards light. And uh, with simple experiments, he actually realized that the perception where light is perceived is actually happening somewhere else uh, where the growth response is, uh, is uh, actually taking place. And that's how we kind of figured that there's a, a, a growth promoting substance that, that is on the on the move. Uh, nowadays, we know that that movement is uh, is an active transport from cell to cell. Um, and uh, and the paper that that we um, that we published here in in development um, actually also gets into this direction because it also looks at plants and how plants uh, adapt to the environment. Uh, and here's the lead author, and actually the the the, the brain behind the, the entire paper um, is, is actually Elena Ferraru, um, and uh, she has a, a, a very uh, nice system that she looks at because she looks at how plants react to elevated temperature. So she is transferring plants from a normal temperature range from of 21 to 29, and uh, what happens is actually she, she sees then that there's a, a growth promoting effect in, in these roots, um, and she wanted to figure out uh, what um, how this is molecularly controlled. Um, and there were uh, papers before that, that were saying that, that this is not related to auxin, but actually she could show that it is related to auxin, it just follows a very different uh, mechanism than, than uh, what was known before. So auxin is, is required in order to, to push this, uh, this growth um, in, in roots. And she could uh, pinpoint this to a molecular response. So she showed that at high temperature, there is actually repression of the so-called PILS proteins, what you can see here. So uh, she used a, a promoter element that is constitutively expressing this PILS GFP fusion. And under normal uh, temperature, uh, you see it actually glowing. But once you shift it to 29, within hours, uh, the, the protein would actually disappear. So there's a post translational regulation that depends on the, the temperature. Um, and what are these PILS proteins doing? Uh, so they sit at the endoplasmatic reticulum, and they are putative carriers for the hormone auxin. And the idea here is actually that they transport auxin from the cytosol into the ER lumen, and thereby they, they basically lock away uh, this growth regulator. Because auxin, uh, if it is sitting in the ER lumen, it can no longer diffuse into the nucleus where it would see its receptors and where it would reprogram uh, transcriptionally responses. So as such, the high temperature is using basically uh, the PILS proteins to, to accelerate or deaccelerate um, the auxin responses and thereby growth responses. Um, so she figured that the response depends on, on, on the pilses, uh, but she didn't know how the pills turnover was controlled. And as we had no indication, so she teamed up actually with her husband, with Mugo, uh, because Mugo uh, really likes high throughput and he uh, is, um, is a big fan of forward genetics. So they started this forward genetic approach, um, initially targeting to, to identify factors that control um, the, the, the turnover of the PILS protein. So to do so, they mutagenized um, these, these lines that I just introduced before using the constitutive promoter 
to be sure that they just look at protein uh, responses. Um, they grew the, the mutated plants, they have the M2, which is basically a collection of, of many, many mutations. Um, and then they took these plants uh, to the fluorescent binocular, and they were looking for mutants that either had a, a decreased um, uh, level of, of the pilses or an increased level of the pilses, assuming that these mutants would affect the, the turnover response of, uh, of these proteins. And these are um, actual images from the screen because so they, they realized that already at 21, so at the control conditions, they identified thereby mutants uh, that had a lower um, intensity. So they called them the, the gloomy mutants. And they identified mutants that had a higher intensity than, than the controls, uh, which they called the shiny mutant. And therefore, uh, all the mutants that they identified in the screen, they, they called gloomy and shiny pills mutants, or in short, the GASP mutants. And the GASP-1, that is uh, the, the main star of, of this uh, uh, paper, is actually a typical one that uh, downregulates the PILS proteins, as you can see here, so in, in the root tip, uh, a lower level. And this downregulation uh, also um, coincides with the rescue of the overexpression phenotypes. So compared to wild type, these PILS overexpressors usually have shorter roots uh, and also um, dwarf uh, aerial parts. Um, but in the GAS1 mutant background, um, in agreement with the downregulation of the protein level, this one is rescued to the Y type level. All right, so what is this GAS1 doing? Um, so after rough mapping and, um, uh, and a sequencing approach, they identified um, a mutation in the ring E3-like ubiquity ligase. Um, and um, so they identified a point mutation. We didn't really know uh, what exactly this point mutation is doing, um, but we felt this was an, uh, a suitable uh, candidate because obviously ubiquitin ligases, they are involved in activating ubiquitin, hooking it up uh, to a substrate, and this substrate is actually designed for, for degradation. So I think the, the first um, or, or the initial hope of Elena was that maybe she identified here a factor that is directly involved in, in regulating the, the pills abundance. So she went on um, and confirming that gas bun is really, um, in, um, or that this mutation is causal for the phenotype um, by uh, getting an, an additional allele, so a knockout allele that we call then the gas 1-2. Gas 1-2 looks pretty similar um, to the gas 1-1. Um, uh, so down regulation of, of the pilses uh, uh, to a similar degree um, as, as the EMS mutant. And also this down regulation correlates with the rescue um, of the pils protein. So there are two uh, weird things uh, if, if you consider that this could be a direct regulator, because if you downregulate or knock out um, the uh, E3 ligase, you would expect the direct substrate would be upregulated, but we see a downregulation suggesting this is not a direct regulation. The other thing that was weird is that if we have a, a post effect on the, the pills levels, then you would assi assume that also the, the uh, gas mutant in the wild type background uh, would have a phenotype, but we see that the gas one knockout mutant is hardly distinguishable from from the wild type. So these are where, where two observations that we are already kind of puzzling. So, but we went on. We we confirmed that actually um, uh, this gene is is a causal reason for the phenotype. We did that um, by analyzing the F1 cross between the gas one dash one and the gas one dash two allele. So assuming that they both, if they both hit the same gene uh, causing this, this phenotype, then they, the F1 generation should look alike. The control cross was actually a GAS1 cross with a wild type, which should look different in the, in the F1. So this confirmed actually um, that indeed um, we identified the right gene and that is causal for the, for the actual downregulation um, of the PILS proteins. All right. So at this point, um, we thought, so very likely guess one is actually controlling the abundance of some unknown factor, which we call here substrate. Um, and this factor is indirectly affecting um, the, the protein abundance of the, of the pilses. All right, so what we knew was that if we downregulate gas one we downregulate PILS proteins. And as we know, the PILS proteins is a, are negative regulators of auxin signaling. We assume that auxin signaling goes actually up. So the, the prediction was that if we now look into the GAS1 mutants, auxin signaling should be uh, elevated. And to our surprise, we actually observed the opposite. 
So what you see here is a DF5 uh, reporter. This is a synthetic uh, um, reporter that, that kind of marks the cells of uh, that, that have high activity of, um, of auxin signaling. Um, and you see here mature root zones um, in the wild type versus the mutant. So you see there's a drastic down regulation of this auxin response. And the same is also happening in dark drawn hypercontinents. So it's not a, a tissue specific defect. So the same thing we, we could also confirm by just um, extracting um, the, the, the messenger RNA and looking at a handful of, um, of auxin responsive gene. So again, so the, um, you have a comparison here of the Y type versus the GASP1-2 knockout mutant, where we see that these, these genes are indeed downregulated. So this is odd because usually if you have a downregulation of auxin signaling, you also should actually have a phenotype, but these mutants, they don't have a phenotype, so they are not distinguishable from, from Y type. So in, in principle, on a molecular level, they look pretty much like the, the PILS uh, overexpressors because they also downregulate the auxin signaling, right? And now if we combine these two negative regulators of, of auxin, uh, we don't see an enhancement. And very likely we don't see enhancement because the pills protein levels are actually downregulated in these GASP1 mutants. So what we figured here is actually that there could be a, a compensatory mechanism in, in place um, that actually downregulates the pills and therefore cancels out the, the phenotype that we usually would see with such a molecular um, auxin phenotype. So one of the hypotheses we had is that actually the, the effects, uh, the, the strong down regulation of, of auxin signaling in the GAS-1 is somehow sensed and uh, initiates a signal to down regulate the, the PILS protein. So as such, auxin would have uh, a homeostatic uh, effect on its own signaling. We kind of tested that by, by um, looking whether auxin indeed has a, a post-instational effect on, on the PILSs. Um, so here you see uh, the control condition um, and, and seedlings where we treated um, or we, we exposed them to, to high auxin. Um, and we saw indeed an upregulation, despite the fact that we use a constitutive promoter. So assuming again that the turnover of the pills is, is, is reduced. And we did the opposite by uh, blocking auxin biosynthesis. So inducing low auxin conditions. And we saw the opposite. So the pills would indeed downregulate. So we came a, a long way with, with the screen. So initially uh, hoping that we will identify um, direct uh, regulators of, of PILS protein abundance. Um, so at least in, in case of GAS1, we realized that the effect on the PILS proteins is actually indirect. Um, and in the course of the project, we realized that this indirect effect is actually via an effect uh, um, uh, on nuclear auxin uh, signaling. So we still don't know how GASP1 is actually molecularly connected to uh, nuclear auxin signaling. Um, and we also still don't know um, how PILS turnover is, is molecularly regulated. But what we realized by, by this um, uh, project is that um, apparently GASP1 has, has a very strong effect and, and it downregulates auxin signaling. But this one is not causing the, the expected uh, phenotype because very likely this is because of this homeostatic feedback that it exerts. So it's downregulates the PILS protein levels. And if we have a downregulation of the pro PILS protein level, as this one is a negative uh, regulator of the nuclear auxin signaling, we actually impact on, on the elevation of, uh, of nuclear auxin signaling. And we assume that these two molecular responses uh, cancel each other out. And, and that kind of explains how um, we have a safeguarded uh, developmental aspect here. So as I said, so the, the main contributors of, of this uh, work um, were actually Elena uh, Ferraro and, and her husband, um, uh, Mugurel Ferraro. Um, they got supported by some local collaborators at the Boku in, in Vienna, um, mainly by the Corbey lab. Um, and um, well, they, they got uh, uh, nice uh, support uh, by, by uh, diverse uh, funding organizations. And I thank you for your um, attention. So thank you very much, uh, Jürgen. Um, anyone has any questions, could they please put them in the uh, question and answer? So we first of the questions that's come up, coming back to the initial question you asked around temperature regulation, is GASP1 regulated in a temperature dependent manner? Um, 
well, GASP-1, I don't know whether GASP-1 itself is regulated in a, in a temperature dependent manner, but, um, but certainly we didn't see an enhancement uh, or a temperature dependent enhancement of the effect on, on the pulses. So um, even in the high temperature, we still get, get a, a further reduction. And, um, and in relative terms, it was the same like we, we would uh, observe it in, in the wild type. At the moment, I, at the moment, I don't understand you. I don't hear you properly. I don't know whether it is my connection or yours. I can uh, you're breaking up a little bit. I don't hear you. Steve might be having some connection problems. Um, we have a couple more questions in, in the Q&A box. Um, one is, is, any change if, is there any change if pills or different pills only regulate a specific time in development? So does pills act at any specific time during development? Sorry, so um, were the pills? Are regulated in a temporal way during plant development? Well, they they um, well we have in Arabidopsis we have seven different pilses um, and they are spatially and temporally uh, controlled in a in a very different way. Um, so if if you overlay them, uh, you you get the impression that that they are everywhere and and may contribute to to a lot of things. Um, um, but each of the pilses may have have particular regulations as well. Okay, thank you. And I'll ask one last question and give Steve a chance to come back. Um, do GASP-1 mutants affect other plant functions, or is it just growth? Um, this is this is hard to tell because we we only oh, looked at the, the. Are you still there? Steve, I have, an, I have an echo now. Um, we, we, we mainly characterize it um, in um, in the growth essays that that we that we looked at, um, and I would assume that. If we would induce certain stresses or, or changes in the environment, we would still trigger some some phenotypes, but but we didn't go there. Okay, thank you.